Good morning, everyone. Hope you're all having a lovely day and welcome to another SACPA session. SACPA acknowledges that this event takes place on the land of the Blackfoot people and Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. And we pay respect to their past, present and future cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship to the land. Today, we're very happy to have with us Michael Lavorato on the topic of sustainable agriculture, food security and aquaponics. Michael has been passionate about environmental sustainability all his life. He started working in aquaponics over the last five years to promote and enhance sustainable food systems. He has built over 40 aquaponic systems across Alberta in schools, libraries and continuing care facilities. Thank you very much, Michael, for joining us today. And we're looking forward to your talk. Thank you, thank you. So, um, how do I see the PowerPoint exactly? Sorry yeah. for that. On my end no. of As I mentioned when we did the test, you just tell me when we keep going. You just get to see me. Okay, so I'll look at my yes, own PowerPoint please. slide then, okay? Okay, I understand. Sorry about that. Okay, so, okay, so aquaponics in Alberta, and you can see the yep. first slide there, everyone. So I've been doing this for uh, about four years now, four and a half years now in schools. Um, aquaponics is the uh, is a growing method which uses the combination of fish, bacteria, and plants for a continued growth cycle. This growing method uh, continues to be relevant as things continue to get worse around the region. Um, the Old Man River. Um, CBC had an eye opener on it this week. Uh, continues to decline. Uh, the, the, the decline continues to accelerate faster than most most of uh, even the worst predictions were. Uh, we continue to see glyphosate in the water, pesticides, herbicides. Uh, every indicator is bad. Everything is bad. Um, so my my little project continues to become more relevant. Um, World populations continue to rise. We got about 8 billion people now. Uh, we're not sure what that's going to look like. Uh, food security continues to be a problem globally. Um, looks like we're on the, the worst case scenario tracks continually, uh, continuously. Um, here's a little uh, graphic on the next slide here on historic and future land use. Um, and this is just the amount of land use within the region. Um, like I said, I've been talking to anglers, uh, guides, uh, the Tent Mountain, uh, which is on our side of the Rockies, continues to, um, continues to re release uh, elements such as selenium. We continue to find trout and other fish in our rivers that don't have any gill plates. Uh, again, we are on the worst case scenario. Uh, and then uh, coupled with that, we are seeing a decline in the amount of farmable land. Uh, we continuously see larger farmers uh, sell out to even larger farmers to cash in as their kids want to get away from agriculture. Climate change, we are on the worst case scenario uh, patterns. We continue to see nothing, no good signs uh, there as well. So. Here is uh, a technology that I found about seven years ago. And um, I, th I thought it would be uh, something that could help uh, this region. And here's a little presentation on it. This video, um, uh, slide six, are you on slide six, six Annalisa? Yeah, slide, slide six. Well, this video, we're going to play a video now. This is uh, Murray Hellman from Australia. He's an aquaponics scientist that uh, works on uh, aquaponics. This, this eight minute video is going to uh, really hit a lot of the points that aquaponics, um, is, uh, that aquaponics So we're just going to play the video now. Do I play the video on your side or do you play it on mine? You play it? Okay, go ahead. And let me know when it's finished. Murray Hallam, and I've been so fortunate in travelling the world looking at aquaponics farms in all sorts of climates, cold climates, hot climates, and wonderful even climates. And I just want to tell you that I feel that aquaponics is the most wonderful thing because of the possibilities, the 
possibilities are endless. We can grow wonderful, healthy, chemical-free crops in old disused warehouses, on old disused tennis courts, concrete pavements. We can grow it in the deserts. We can grow it in the tropical jungle uh, where we might not be able to grow food because the soils are depleted. The possibility of growing aquaponics anywhere and producing wonderful chemical-free food are almost endless. This is a technology for this time. The value of aquaponics is in the fact that it is pure food. It is grown in an ecosystem. Now, not only is it economically viable because of the increasing number of people around the world who are prepared to pay for better quality food. That's one end of the value. The other end of the value is in social value. For example, building aquaponic systems in desert areas where people just simply can't grow fresh veggies and fish any other way as efficiently as you can in an aquaponic system. That is extreme value, both financial, social and ethical value. The ethical value goes down to the fact that we are growing things in a system that will not harm the environment in any way, shape or form. We are not using synthetic chemicals in the form of pesticides or fertilizers. So aquaponics has got great value in those three areas. So what is the concept of aquaponics and how does it work? Very briefly, we grow fish and plants together. We provide both um, really good protein and also wonderful vegetables. So in brief, without getting too technical, what we do is we have a tank with fish in it, and this can be on any scale, it can be a small system at a home, or it can be a large farm. So we have fish in tanks, we pump the fish water out of the tanks through various styles of grow beds where we grow vegetables. What do the vegetables do? The vegetables extract the nutrients out of the water and return the water fresh to the fish. So we have a closed loop ecosystem that is just so wonderful and it works so astonishingly well. This is the wonderful thing about aquaponics. This is what sets it apart from other methodologies that are out there because aquaponics is actually derived from the best of both aquaculture and hydroponics. And we don't have many of the problems that are experienced by both those other technologies. For example, hydroponics. We don't need to dump water. We simply don't need to do that. And in places where water is such a precious thing, which quite frankly is almost all over the earth now, but in places where it's particularly a problem, we don't want to waste water by dumping water into the environment somewhere. Even if we put it in a containment tank, it's not the same. We keep the water circulating at all times in an aquaponic system. And that's the same thing with aquaculture. That's the growing of fish in tanks or in ponds. When you grow fish in tanks, Typically, you have to dump about 10% of the water every day. We don't have to do that in aquaponics. So they're two of the great advantages. And we grow our vegetables and our fish in a natural environment that makes it healthier for the humans to eat. That's us. Makes it much healthier for us and healthier for the plants and the fish. be absolutely astonished at the quality of the yield. The quality of the produce is just amazing. And that, once again, I hate to keep saying it, but we go back to the fact that we're growing this in as natural a system as we possibly can. So that the plants have the opportunity to take up all the minerals that are needed for the great plant health and for our wonderful health when we consume them. And the same applies to the fish. Do you know it's very rare to get sick fish in an aquaponic system? It's rare, you hardly ever see it. And that's because we're trying to employ, at all times, natural processes. So the quality of the produce is absolutely amazing. You can see around me and behind me here, the deep dark green of the produce, and it just grows so wonderfully well. And we haven't had to put a whole lot of chemicals into it, like other processes do. We are just relying on natural processes. Aquaponics is based on solid science. Solid scientific um, research has been carried out on aquaponics for more than 30 years. So we can develop and build systems that are based on solid formula,
and solid um, boundaries which we outlay to make the system work exactly the way it's intended to be. Now whilst we're working with nature, we are beginning to understand more about how Mother Nature works and the microbes, the protozoa, the bacterium, the fungi, all these things that operate in a natural environment are encouraged and developed in an aquaponic system. And we do this based on science so that we can be assured of a very positive outcome. The beautiful thing about aquaponics is it's perfectly scalable. The rules that apply to a home system, a small home system, the same rules extrapolated become applicable to a large farm. And you know the wonderful thing about it as well? Take a look at this particular farm. One of our designs being built by one of our wonderful students in Hong Kong and now been running for several months, in fact a couple of years I've got to be honest. And this farm produces right now at this very moment over 60 different vegetable crops at the same time. Now that is something that is absolutely impossible in a hydroponic system. It is just wonderful. So this caters extremely well to niche markets and specialty markets like we have in Hong Kong that this farm has developed where Madam wants to buy the best quality material, best quality produce for her family. And she can get a great variety that's grown in this wonderful farm. So it's particularly applicable to small to medium enterprises. We honestly believe we're going to see an absolute outburst of small to medium farms around the world in aquaponics. As people become more aware of food miles and buying food locally, we're going to see loads and loads of small to medium enterprises. In fact, it's happening right now. It's starting to develop right now. I think that should be so let's summarize. I think that should be a bit of video. Aquaponics is environmentally responsible. Like no other farming method we have at the moment, it's environmentally responsible. It's water wise. An Australian researcher has shown. Can you go to the next slide, Annalisa? Can you go yeah. to the next slide, Annalisa? I think we're just, we got some issues. So I'm just going to cut that video off, everyone. And the reason being is just uh, time constraints. So I, I, I think some of the some of the uh, points that Murray really hit on there is um, no synthetic chemicals or fertilizers. It uses 90% less water than traditional soil agriculture, which is really hard to wrap your head around until you start using buckets to uh, to water your own outdoor soil gardens and and just realizing how much water you're using. Uh, and this is this is nothing compared to compared to our farms in the region. Uh, so you get the fish, the protein, and the vegetables, the fish protein and the vegetables together in a closed loop ecosystem. You don't waste uh, anything. It's scalable. You can do it small, you can do it big, and it cuts down on food miles. So it has some, uh, it has science that backs it up. There's a, um, uh, an aquaponics research center here in Lethbridge where I learned uh, most of the uh, ins and outs of this trade. And then I created, uh, my wife and I and some partners created Aquaponics World. Uh, this is slide eight, Annalisa. So, uh, and then we can go to slide, uh, 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 yeah, slide eight. Um, we work with, um, we just received a grant through the federal government and we're working with the Lethbridge Sustainable Living Association. Uh, we teach students how to, um, how to use this method. And what's, what's really neat about aquaponics is that even on a small um, hundred gallon system of two by four foot by six and a half foot tall system in schools, uh, they can learn the basics of aquaponics and hopefully grow from there. We also, as a, as a society, are constantly applying for grants to try to, um, to build greenhouses as well, which we haven't been successful yet. And as, uh, to date, we've only built the little, the little micro systems, uh, 50 of them. Uh, we can go to slide nine now. So the build, uh, we come in, we build the systems with students and staff if they want, or we build them themselves. We show them how the ease of building an aquaponic system. The design is not that elaborate. You need a fish tank for fish, and then you need a separate grow bed for, for, for plants. Um, so we can go to slide 10, so you can kind of see what a design looks like here. Fish tank on the bottom, uh, piped up into a grow bed on top. And slide 11. These are systems we build as well using farm IBC water totes. These are 250 gallon systems that we show students how to build. This is called a chop and flip system where you chop the top third off of a IBC tote 
and uh, you use that to grow plants on top of fish. And we can go to slide 12. Uh, so there's endless designs, but it's all the same principles. Next slide. So we also come in and teach the chemistry of how uh, the system works, the biology, the chemistry. Um, the nitrogen cycle is something all students can grasp. Uh, grade seven students, we once had a grade seven student that uh, was, 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 was very meticulous and, and, and could understand how to run the system by himself. So this system is all graspable biological concepts, uh, all natural concepts. And we go to the next slide, slide 14 is the biology. Uh, our, our, our society comes in and teaches uh, students about fish health uh, and just data they can keep on their fish. Um, some systems keep the fish for food, some, most keep them for pets. And, and this is just something that adds to the uh, community aspect of the school as well. Uh, we teach students how to germinate, uh, slide 15. We teach students how to germinate um, in these systems as well, um, how to grow plants in this method. And, and it's all, it's all uh, something after about a year of help with these systems that the uh, schools usually take over and they can keep care of themselves going forward. Um, looking at plant deficiencies on slide 16, plant balance, nutrient deficiencies. And here are some pictures of what we built. Um, this is what a system looks like. So it checks, the science checks out for aquaponics. It's now just about, uh, for me, I found this niche of um, enjoying teaching students how to do it, but also hoping the technology gets some exposure and we can actually start to change things in this region before it's too late, if it's not too late already. And here is slide 18. Uh, more systems we have built. Um, you can see the bean uh, plant on top of the fish. Uh, this system is closed loop. The plants will uh, filter the water back for the fish. They'll take up those nitrates, which are toxins for the fish and, and, and filter them. And it's clean water. Like Marie said, the fish in aquaponics are quite uh, a bit more healthy than fish in traditional uh, aquaculture. Uh, slide 19, these are just examples of some of the, um, of the plants we can grow in our system. So we got healthy vegetables, leafy greens and herbs. Um, there's, there's certain plants that, um, that grow well in aquaponics and there's uh, certain plants that um, still prefer um, soil-based substrate. So not everything works in aquaponics. Aquaponics uh, does very well with things like basil, leafy greens, but it also will grow, uh, as you can see on slide 20, things like uh, tomatoes and peppers. Uh, here's just a picture on slide 21 of some students in, uh, in Lundbrook, Alberta, enjoying their system. Slide 22, one of the, the things in our program is it uh, encourages, um, the, 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 you can get almost endless plants throughout the year to supplement uh, food classes, nutritional programs, the cafeteria. Um, that being said, we we're hoping that eventually these systems would be a, 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 would be a jump start into greenhouses. Uh, maintaining the system on slide 23, uh, fish size, um, selling the fish, uh, a lot of systems. We do ornamental fish like koi. Kids have quite a bit of fun finding uh, koi ponds and keeping care of um, things like um, people's backyard ponds for, for uh, veggie control, so uh, vegetation control. Um, so kids, I think the most expensive koi was sold around $110 and that, that took about eight months to grow. But that being said, we have lots of, um, of, of, of fish um, that students can either harvest for food or, or ornamental fish. Um, and these systems will keep care of themselves in the summer months of schools as well, which is quite neat. They're quite self-containing. We do place automatic food feeders on them, but these fish do quite well with low feed rates and uh, they can adjust quite, uh, quite, uh, quite well. 
So um, the cleaning of the systems, we teach them how to do that. There's social value of the systems that I never predicted. I liked the science and the ability of aquaponics. This is on slide 24. But um, um, the social value is something, uh, this kind of almost mindfulness, almost uh, meditational value, uh, meditation around the systems, the fish, just having a live animal in schools um, is something that we found a lot of kids, a lot of kids with um, students that use the system to, to self-regulate. Um, they're allowed to go out and, and sit around the system for 15, 20 minutes, come back into class, go back out when they need to kind of center so that's something I didn't predict, but it's something that I've, I've really liked seeing in schools. They, they're, they've kind of become uh, more of something we put in common rooms or libraries where they become kind of a community thing. Uh, staff have meetings around them. It's just something nice to kind of have moving water, fish, plants growing in, in our colder months, especially the lights, the grow lights. Uh, there is the, the, the business skills around selling the fish. And, and I always like to warn students, um, even though the science checks out, it doesn't mean the, uh, the market uh, will respond to that science. So you have to have these, this ability to, to find out if aquaponics works in your area, if you want to build a greenhouse or sell fish. And this is something I, I tell people who, who want to open aquaponics. Slide 25. Um, part of our program too is we... Um, we take uh, students on uh, field trips to local aquaponic farms, uh, the Lethbridge College uh, Aquaponic Center, so they can kind of see this opportunity and, and, and maybe just give um, some more, uh, you know, just seeing the small microsystems might not be enough for the students. Seeing an actual working farm, then they can actually kind of start to put it together if this is something that is uh, possible. Um, uh, size, uh, slide 26 is this is a this is a farm in Nobleford flavor fresh farms or fresh flavor farms this is a working aquaponics farm ran by tilapia a few hundred tilapia and then slide 27 slide 28 in the next slide you can see uh, lettuce this is a 10,000 square foot greenhouse growing hundreds of heads of lettuce hundreds of heads of lettuce and kale Slide 30, I like to go in and teach uh, students, staff, wherever I do presentations of the, just the potential to grow food in this area. Um, the water issue is, is going to increasingly be something that's going to put a damper on, on infrastructure and development growth in this issue. This is, this is something I didn't even uh, see five, seven years ago, but this is going to be a serious issue that it, it's going to be, it's, we're going to get into real uh, fights about water between farmers, industry. But anyway, on slide 30, you can see that there is some uh, new uh, farm starting up in Calgary South area of uh, Calgary and South aquaponics, um, urban farms, urban growing that uh, meets these environmental goals and hopefully can, can help alleviate some of the problems in the area. And slide 31. Uh, just uh, hopefully this small step we make as a, as a society and as a, um, and as my, as a, as my small aquaponics gig can, can kind of make a difference in this area. Um, slide 33. Um, I just like to warn people with aquaponics so that it's, it's not a silver bullet. Um, I've been studying um, sustainable living my, for, for 20 years now. Um, uh, throughout university, college, um, there's a lot more people that see the environmental issues around and, and, and believe that there's going to be silver bullet technologies. I think it's going to have to be a combination of a lot of things and a lot of uh, societal shifts, not just technology. So uh, that's it. And I'll leave it on page uh, 34. I, I think I'm running out of time here. Page 34, just some... Um, testimonials of the of, of the project it was that okay Annalisa sorry I've never done a presentation where I just look at the slides and not an audience so yeah it's, it's I know quite it's difficult. quite strange that yeah um thank you yeah. that was fantastic um and I'll just um jump right into the questions if you're ready okay yeah. go 
Go ahead. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Our first question comes from um, Henny Mandel. How many aquaponic farms in southern Alberta and where? You're looking at Calgary South. You're looking at about 12 that I know of. Um, uh, one in Nobleford, one near Granham. There's a few near Calgary, uh, a few north of Calgary. It's still quite a new technology. And the problem, the problem with aquaponics is it has a higher startup cost than traditional soil, uh, soil uh, greenhouses. Uh, and another problem that I did not foresee uh, happening was I, I believed as uh, environmental degradation was going to get worse in Southern Alberta, what we were going to see was an upstart of new technology but the problem being now is that we have uh, even further increased supply costs in the last couple of years so uh, it's it's we're really in a tough spot here for, for food development it's like um, it's like the traditional uh, technology we use uh, to keep our system going we know isn't going to be enough yet now we're running into the problems of if we're going to have an enough supplies and enough goods and enough uh, manpower to actually move to new technologies. That's why in one of the last slides, I, I tell students and, and, and people, this is going, these problems are going to need a lot more than just technology. It's going to need massive social shifts. So yeah, hopefully I didn't go overboard on that question. <laughs> You're good. Yeah. Um, our next question comes from Claude Peterson. Are you working closely with Nick Savidov and Lethbridge College? Yeah, so when we started, yeah, good question. So we did work with Nick Savidov quite a bit. Savidov is kind of the, 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 the master behind turning the uh, Lethbridge College into an aquaponics, uh, to, to having an aquaponics research facility after their experiment with uh, grass carp kind of failed in the 80s and 90s. So Nick kind of bailed that program out and has now built, I think they just opened a new $3 million greenhouse that is going to uh, feed most of Lethbridge College. So yes, we have worked with Nick. We've worked with the Lethbridge, uh, University of Lethbridge to uh, make our, our, our program also tie to the curriculum of each grade level in Alberta. Um, Nick, this program is not possible without Nick and without the Aquaponics uh, Center of Excellence. So yes, we are working closely with them all the time. Um, I, I guess we're one of the new stages we're, we're kind of working on too is working with Nick and Sean Ali from the University of Lethbridge in urban uh, food development as well. So yes, yeah, we are working with Nick and we do field trips to Nick's uh, research facility as Excellent. well. Our next question comes from Mark Goodall. Initially at the Brook, at the Brooks facility, it was found that tilapia was the easiest fish, but not commercially viable. Can more commercially sought after fish be cultured on a large scale? This is a, this is a very, very, very good question. And it's something I've thought a lot about, something that I teach uh, and something that I've, I've, um, I, I've, I've tried to, to meet the right, uh, and tried to connect with the right uh, individuals in politics and 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 uh, at the college and university to to kind of convey this message. Tilapia as a f fish, there's a, there's a um, uh, what's the Canadian saying? The Canadian saying is like um, overrated. No, yeah. Uh, in, in Italian, it's like um, if something is finished, like it's just not good or it's not going to work. They call it cooked, like it's overcooked. Um, tilapia, the reputation of this fish is just, it, East Asian markets have just absolutely collapsed the reputation of tilapia. Um, North Americans largely aren't accepting tilapia as a fish they want to eat on a large scale. There is the second largest tilapia farm about 15 kilometers west of me uh, in Granham. That's uh, Klaus Van Toon's tilapia farm. So he does make hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars selling tilapia and shipping them to Vancouver. That being said, I, I think that fish is that fish in that market are basically tapped out. People don't like it. The reputation is cooked. Um, I, 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 I think 
the Alberta government has done a, a very poor job in allowing uh, aquaculture and, and aquaponics farms to experiment with new fish. With the program, I have connections with wholesale fish out of Singapore and Hong Kong that we bring in. That being said, there, there's a difference between hobby fish and fish that you can, you can market for sale. I think there is endless, there is endless freshwater fish and there's, uh, there's people contacting me all the time, you know, can, can we do burbot? Can we do catfish? And, and the problem comes uh, is that the Alberta government is just, their focus in agriculture right now is just not there. Um, I mean, they're still largely stuck in, 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 in continuing, uh, continuing to help out traditional agriculture sources and, and aqu aquaculture is just something not on their radar uh, yet. So yeah, I think there is marketable fish out there. Uh, and there's fish that Albertans and Canadians will accept as something they would eat regularly, but uh, we're just we're just not there yet. Our next question comes from Laura Schultz. Sorry, missed the session as my computer crashed. So if you've covered this, my apologies. What scale of build would be required for a community for a community to have an aquaponic system to use as a food source? I, I mean, it's all scalable. You, the, the thing with aquaponics is it comes down to, um, I mean, how many community members, uh, we, we've, how many community members do you want to feed? How often? Um, you're looking at that like 20 to 50 square foot greenhouse before you start really being able to produce um, an ample amount of feed for, uh, food for, for people. This this is something we've drawn up with the Lethbridge College, 22 by 52 foot square uh, greenhouse that would grow about four to 500 plants every couple months. And this would hopefully uh, support a, a large school. So a school population, you know, uh, three, four, five, 600. Um, and, and, and so it, it, it's a like, I, I know what you're trying to say. It's a little bit of a tough question in the sense of, um, how, how much food, how much food do you want to produce? Um, the, uh, aquaponics is a great growing uh, method. Um, it would just come down to the initial startup costs as well would be would be one of the issues you'd run into. Um, and it's something you'd have to plan plan for. If you're going to do that route, and you haven't had experience with aquaponics before, it might be a, a neat idea to actually build a greenhouse and do uh, one third aquaponics, one third hydroponics, one third soil, and learn the three uh, growing methods and, and then choose the method you like most. And if any of the particular growing methods have problems, uh, at least you'd have the other two to kind of um, supplement while you figure out those problems. Okay, our next question comes from Beth Mundell. Could you please explain more about how you integrate this into the Alberta K-12 school curriculum and with whom? Okay, so we met with the University of Lethbridge uh, and they helped me, the Agility Center helped me. Um, um, the K-12 curriculum is all accessible online. So anybody can access it. And basically what we did is we sat down together for days and we just looked at the system and things that we could grab from the system and that were uh, applicable to, to grade one, two, three, four, five, all the way up to grade 12. Um, I'm, uh, does this kind of answer the question? Sorry, uh, I kind of... Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll read it out could again. You could you please mm -hmm. explain more about yeah. how you integrate how you integrate this into the Alberta K-12 school curriculum and with whom? Oh yeah, so yeah, so I answered the question somewhat, uh, somewhat okay, I think. Um, basically, we're looking at, um, we're taking the system that we've used for four or five years now and we're just grabbing concepts that we see as, uh, that we can tie to, like grade five, you know, saving water or grade seven, you know, the pH, uh, what pH is and, and stuff like, uh, and, and examples like that. I hope that was okay. Well, well I don't have any, I can't uh, talk to the person who has the question, so it's a little bit. Yeah, they can elaborate though. Beth, Beth, feel free to elaborate on that question yeah. if, uh, if you want more information.
Yeah. Hopefully that um, was okay. Our next question comes from Trevor Page. It seems that the future of agriculture in North America and other uh, countries is robotics for grain production and aquaponics in vertical farms in cities. What problems do you see in Alberta for mm. vertical farms? Uh, one of the big problems, the probably the biggest problem in Alberta and one of the biggest problems throughout North America is where the subsidies for farming is going. Um, you know, my wife and I have done sheep, rabbits, cattle. Um, this is the focus still in, 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 in agriculture is largely based on, uh, you know, you see the, the, the half a billion dollar bailouts coming for Southern Alberta uh, ranchers for this drought year. The problem with vertical farming, hydroponics and aquaponics, is the, one of the big problems I'm, I'm starting to see, and, and, and it's quite frustrated, is traditional uh, agriculture lobbyists will lobby against these new, uh, these new technologies, even though the science checks out. And because of that, they don't receive the subsidies. And if you don't receive the subsidies, you're competing against traditional agriculture and that are receiving subsidies. It's, it's, it's just not a, the, the, the playing field is not even level. Uh, it, it's fixed to begin with. There's no, it's very, very difficult for Alberta hydroponic and aquaponic farmers to compete with California and Mexico uh, that when they're receiving massive subsidies. So unless these, 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 um, these uh, these new technologies start receiving uh, help that the competing is very difficult. Um, you know, you see a lot of people start off with aquaponic farms in this region, and their produce is expensive. Whereas it's 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 um, so that's a problem. Another problem is just the wage costs here in Alberta are still quite high. That being said, transportation costs, climate change is. Is, is set in California and is setting the Southwest United States and Mexico back. So even though they have the advantage of, of the sun, of weather, uh, they've kind of created problems for themselves. So possibly as they get more expensive, it will be easier for Albertan uh, new tech farmers to compete. Why? Um, why are there so many subsidies in farming? What is it about farming that requires those subsidies? I mean, I'm not, I'm not a, I'm not a economist in, in, in any sense from, from what I understand about the subsidies in farming, it just comes down to the, the world needs food. And this is just something we're willing to subsidize through the government. And, um, I'm not, I'm not trying to say the government is doing a, uh, and, and our policymakers are doing a terrible job. Obviously, we've lifted billions of people out of poverty in the last 50 years. We have more access to healthy food than ever before in history right now. And in tomorrow, we will have more access to food. We're going to have problems with climate change. But that being said, I, policy doesn't shift quickly, right? It's, it takes time to work with policymakers to convince them uh, of new technologies. They've been burnt before by people who want handouts and, and, and money and um, simply, uh, you know, that doesn't work out. So from a policy perspective, I can see why we stick to what we're good at and what we know will work. We, at the end of the day, we just want to make sure people have food and people are healthy and they're not angry and starving. You know, that's, that's probably the, the basis of our, of our total society, right? You know, we don't want to complete utter breakdown. So yeah, it's just about uh, communicating. Uh, guys like Nick Savadoff have spent a lifetime communicating. And uh, it's just about, um, it's just about continually showing this, th these new technologies work. Uh, like I said, at the end of the, they're not a silver bullet, they will not replace all traditional methods. Uh, this is just um, aquaponics will largely be and th this person who asked this question before, I think aquaponics is largely going to supplement supplement uh, urban uh, consumers. It's a technology that will cut down on food miles. It produces high, high quality food that doesn't have any insecticides or herbicides, you know, stuff like glyphosate. So all those things that 
consumers are looking for biological organic grown food, right? Um, that being said, it's not going to, you know, you're not going to, not every, there's not going to be a million aquaponic farms all over the place. It's something that's specialized and it's niche. Um, one of the things about our program too, that it is kind of a win-win is it not only do we teach them about aquaponics and, and that's important to me, but there's a lot of learning methods uh, and learning um, uh, experiences from aquaponics that can be used for students uh, that have that don't want anything to do with agriculture, right? They just want to learn. This is experiential learning, learning something that's in front of them. Um, and also, this is just um, you know our program should, teaches them. You know, local food is 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 really one of the biggest things, no matter how you grow it. Um, so hopefully, aquaponics, this system, uh, and this this uh, uh, little uh, business I've built can teach students okay, aquaponics is neat and I like that, but maybe I'll try this growing method and it's still local and it's still a win for Southern Alberta. Uh, we, we import millions, uh, we've imported billions of dollars worth of food and I, we have the colleges, the universities, we have the workforce, we're the most, one of the most trained healthy workforces in the world. We should be able to cut down on the importation of food, giving uh, you know, places like California and Mexico a break. They don't have to pound their, their, uh, their, um, their agriculture uh, areas as hard, you know, so we can, we can all kind of help each other around the world by, by all putting in our little effort, you know, to, to grow around, uh, to grow around closer to us. So yeah, I hope that Thank answered you. the question. Our next question comes from Mark Goodall. Any interest from tropical fish production for the fish hobbyists? Ah, oh, so this is a good question. So yes, there is um, there is a lot of interest. We do have, we've just, um, I mean, students, we've had lots of uh, fish breed even in systems. The, the, there is lots of interest. There's even been people that have come to us and said, hey, uh, would you like to join our program? We breed or keep, you know, rare fish and then we try to reintroduce them. The problem with tropical fish, and I've been selling tropical fish for uh, my entire life, you know, it's something I've gotten uh, handed to me from my dad, but we, I run a tropical fish store, an online tropical fish store in Lethbridge, Lethbridge Fish Fam, uh, family. Um, is, is the importation of fish is just still so cheap, you know? Um, to get fish from the Philippines or Thailand where they can actually raise them outside with no heating. I mean, the fish market is still so, um, it's just so hard to compete with, with East Asia, to be honest, just because of our, just because of our costs of, uh, our, 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 our employee costs and our, our, our costs to, um, uh, to, to heat things, to, to keep buildings going. Um, that being said, uh, the fish hobby, uh, Canada is one of the largest uh, per capita fish hobbyist places for tropical fish in the world. Uh, Canada, the United States, a few places in Europe. Um, but Canada is near the top. Um, we just had a massive outbreak of zebra mussels that came in on um, moss balls from Ukraine. We continue to have uh, fish diseases come in from Asia, even though they're supposed to be checked in Singapore. This is something the government is taking seriously, and it's something that makes them nervous. Is you know we're appeasing a few hobbyists uh, and really putting our larger ecosystems and agriculture at risk. I've, I've, I've said the solution is to cut down on the importation of fish and grow more domestic fish. So if this happens and the, the playing field changes and we can't import as much, then yes, there could be a market for aquaponics fish. I know aquaponic farmers in Canada and the United States, one gentleman in Calgary, I've forgotten his name, does raise koi and breed koi fingerlings in his system and sells them. This is something we do with our program as well. So yeah, very good question. Uh, is, is, is the aquaponic fish don't necessarily have to be a food source, but possibly 
a, a you can make that money as a hobby source as well. So um, I don't I haven't seen it done on a large scale, but uh, it's very possible. Uh, there's a farmer. If you go on YouTube, there is one guy in Texas who is running multiple greenhouses of tropical cichlids growing plants. And then he's selling the cichlids as uh, as pet cichlids uh, for hobbyists. So very okay. good question. Very interesting. Our next question comes from Laurie Schultz. You may have covered this, but could you comment on who the other stakeholders are in the project? Uh, the other stakeholders, so uh, as far as our uh, fiscal agent for this current grants, Lethbridge Sustainable uh, Society, we, we have a nonprofit wing that we work with here in Fort McLeod called the Fort McLeod Aquaponic Society. It was created by people here in town that wanted to uh, build a community greenhouse and um, did a great, we've done a great job promoting the technology, building small systems. It's very, very difficult, at least I, I, I don't want to discourage anybody, but it's very difficult if anybody has ever worked in the grant world, the non, uh, you know, so it makes me wonder going forward if, if people wanted to do community greenhouses, if you would have to place more of an emphasis on somehow partially privatizing it, selling that, uh, uh, selling the, um, the produce, the fish, uh, or, or whatever you're selling in the greenhouse, uh, as well as renting out the spaces. That was an idea we had with our community greenhouse. Because the problem with relying on grants is they they take forever to to write, and 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 they they and and a large majority of the time, you know, there's endless people in Canada who want endless money for projects that they believe are important. Um, you always believe your project is the most important. But that being said, you're talking about a country with uh, millions of people, the second largest landmass on, on, on earth that uh, wants to, wants to uh, with many different components of people moving parts, with people wanting to try things to, to make their communities better. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so that's kind of some of the stakeholders, uh, Fort McLeod Aquaponics Society, Lethbridge College, uh, the University of Lethbridge Agility Center is somebody we've been working with. We work with a, a, a large amount of private businesses that sell fish, uh, have helped us out. We receive uh, some of our supplies um, at reduced cost from private, from, from private. Uh, uh, okay, our well. next question. Uh, I got a little bit off topic on that question. Okay. I'm sorry, Laurie. Um, Beth Mundell has yeah. um, has uh, clarified uh, clarified her school question. Uh, do you liaise with school districts on special and um, specific or specific schools? So, do you liaise do, do you liaise with school districts or special schools? It it would be good to have a session at the district convention in the spring to get known there. Yeah, so this, uh, this idea of uh, looking at um, uh, district uh, learning sessions or um, what are they, what are they referred to? I'm not sure. Um, kind of divisional meetings is something we've wanted to do. COVID has kind of sent us back a little bit. Um, I find it personally difficult to, and I'm having a little bit of troubles with this presentation. I, I, I find it a little difficult in, with the not, not in person aspect of this whole COVID pandemic to get my message across. Uh, yes, we have worked with individual school divisions and they've set up, um, they've given us contacts with um, uh, uh, particular people to liaison or uh, to be the liaisons of or, or to coordinate this program of what they're looking for. Palliser School Division, we've worked with a few school divisions, but Palliser School Division did a really good job of trying to fit aquaponics into their um, into their larger goals. Um, they they provided students with credits to work on the systems. They um, they they created you know things like horticulture classes around um, not only aquaponics but Palliser did things like um, 
bees in school, like beehives or gardens or little mini greenhouses. So Palisades School Division has been really good with that. Uh, Calgary Board of Education, we've had a little bit of troubles just because of their size. It's not as nimble, but it's something we continue, we continue to work with them. Um, Lethbridge, Livingston Range, uh, School Division, um, uh, West Winds. So yeah, um, I hope that answers the question um, of us trying to work with school divisions and their individual things. I, 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 I'm, I'm happy you brought up the, the fact or, or the, not the fact, but the, the option of, of going to uh, educational um, education um, conventions. That's what it is, conventions. Sorry about that. Now I just need to plug in my laptop, so I apologize. Uh oh, running out of battery. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Old. Okay. Great. Uh, okay, and a and a location shift at the same time. <laughs> no, don't be. I'm sorry. Um, our next question comes from Knut Peterson. In terms of climate change, which arguably is the biggest problem the world will face along with food security. Can aquaponics be a substantial game changer? Very good question. Um, I, I really get nervous about, I, I mean, I've been doing this for five years and I think this is a very meaningful technology. I've met with lots of aquaponics sci uh, scientists who work with aquaponics who say the science checks out. I would have said absolutely five years ago. I'm always nervous to um, to to say aquaponics is a silver bullet technology. Um, aquaponics is a great learning method. It's a great. It's it, it will be a great piece of the puzzle of many 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 pieces we have to put together to make another beautiful picture going forward for ourselves. Because we've done some great things in the past. You can't you can't argue that we have, but we've we've left ourselves exposed in a lot of ways. It's going to be a, a, a piece of the puzzle. How large? I don't know. I mean, the science checks out for it. It, it is food wise. Um, probably as things decline and hopefully they won't decline too much. I'm keeping my fingers crossed. It's going to play a bigger role. So in a, in a very weird sense, I hope I don't see aquaponics become the only thing because it aquaponics and hydroponics vertical farming indoors is kind of what people refer to as like an apocalypse crop i hope it doesn't ever get to that point um it is it is it it, it is using very uh it is recycling resources within a closed loop ecosystem so it's something that we 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 may have to rely on more and more um there has been an absolute explosion of, of urban aquaponics, of urban hydroponics in California and in Texas. And that's because they've become more desperate, right? As things have gotten more desperate there with their water, you've probably read about things like Lake Mead or, 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 or the water shortage in Arizona, California. You know, as things have gotten um, more desperate there, they will, um, this technology will will become more and more prevalent. Um, I, we have, here's the problem with it is, um, I see more and more people setting up greenhouses with, um, in, in traditional, in places where traditional agriculture would have done fine. So if we do things right, we don't really have to panic and hopefully we won't have to panic and do all these things, but we, we may have to. So, um, um, I know the guys at the, the college, uh, Nick Savadoff, Playboys, uh, uh, John Dirksen, one of their big things uh, isn't even the changing climate. It's the amount of nitrates. It's the amount of phosphates and all these fertilizer runoffs here in Southern Alberta that were, uh, it's just from the overuse. It's from, it's from you pounding this, this, our land too hard, trying to get too much out of it, pushing it. You know, um, I know Lethbridge Sustainable uh, Living Society has uh, uh, the president, Mandy, does soil. And she could she could tell you all about how we're pushing this soil agriculture too hard. So 
I, I, I kind of got a little bit off topic there. I hope That's that fine. was okay. Uh, was that Peter? Our Peter. next question comes from Mark Goodall. How do energy requirements compare between aquaponics versus, versus hydroponics commercial operations? So the energy, the amount of energy you're using, everything is about the same. Um, I, I think, I, I hope I'm referring to uh, the right thing here when, you think, when you're saying uh, the, the energy input or the, the, um, what the input is compared to the output. Um, aquaponics, you're going to get higher yields um, because aquaponics, the higher yields in traditional aquaculture and hydroponics, the problem with aquaponics, one of its weaknesses is because it's a biological system. And one of the great things about it is you can't use these things like pesticides, herbicides, fungicides. But at the same time, that's a weakness as well. So you can leave yourself more exposed than those other, uh, those other technologies. When aquaponics is running well, the, the input is, um, is on par with hydroponics. Uh, you might have to look at a bit more input with the fish uh, as far as pumps and aeration processes with that. Uh, also the labor processes of the fish, but you're also getting the, the, the protein back. Whereas hydroponics, you're stuck to, uh, you're stuck with vegetables. You can't, you can't grow animals in, in synthetic uh, water fertilizers, you know? So um I know with aquaponics and hydroponics, sorry, um, the, the input initial costs are high, but the, the yields they can produce uh, will, will make up for that. In, in some cases, I don't, don't want to make any promises to people because um, largely hydroponics and aquaponics has been successful in southern Alberta. I just know that people I've talked to in the United States have, have, have built hydro or aquaponic farms and then had troubles competing with traditional soil uh, uh, soil uh, farmers outdoors. We don't really have lettuce farmers or or tomato growers outdoors here. So you you have a you have that that uh, level playing field here. And another question by Mark Girdle: Do you envision the system being used outdoors in ponds, lakes, and rivers, like floats, similar to our current fish farms? I find I find this very uh, a lot more possible in 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 weather um, um, in, in in places with uh, different weather climates. Uh, you know, in the United States, Mexico, it's a little bit more difficult to raise fish here um, year round. You're gonna I I haven't seen anybody attempt this yet. Um, the problem with doing it in ponds is just the ability to then control that water. I know there's guys in Calgary that are trying it on small scale uh, and, and, and they're experimenting with it. The problem is, it's just, um, the, the, you're running into the problem of, uh, of battling our, our winter and battling our weather here. Um, pumping water, pumping that nitrate water without, uh, in tanks outside, I, I don't see it as, as, as really feasible here. Um, at the moment. Uh, that being said, I could be wrong. It's just something I haven't seen or ran into. Okay, thank you so much. That wraps up all our questions for today. Um, before we end the session, Michael, do you have a take a message for us? Sorry, Sorry Annalisa, yep. I'd just like to, um, a little bit further on that, further on that question. Aquaponics doesn't have to be closed loop. So I can see what the further question was kind of asking. Uh, the second largest tilapia farm in Granham, Alberta, uh, ran by Klaus Dantun. He was doing traditional aquaculture in the sense that he was raising fish and then every week or two weeks as nitrate levels would get high, he would simply dump them into his farm fields. Um, and then he ran into problems with neighbors, you know, this excess water just draining everywhere. Um, he's now switching his system to an aquaponic system that isn't closed loop or some people can take advantage of this in the sense that they they move aquaponics uh water or fish water they pump it into a grow bed or they pump it into a greenhouse so going back to the further uh the previous question is it possible to raise fish 
outside and then pump that water into enclosed greenhouses, possibly that might be something that's more sustainable. Um, yeah. So okay. That's something there. Um, so that wraps up today's session. Um, but before we end it, do you have a take home message for our viewers? I, I think uh, the neat thing that aquaponics has uh, shown me is that the natural processes uh, process are there. You know, we, we've been just chasing technology and, and, and working uh, tirelessly, uh, you know, millions, billions of us human beings. And really, it's just right there. The fish are breathing out aquaponics. 80% of the nutrients you need for the plant are just the fish breathing. It's just them excreting ammonia out of their gills. Um, the processes that were already right there, the bad, we didn't have to invent the bacteria. We didn't have to, uh, we didn't have to whip them into shape there. They're just breaking that ammonia down from the fish and the fish are, are doing their thing. Aquaponics is a new growing method using ancient ancient system the it, the natural system of just a pond next time you're walking around a pond it's got fish in it it's got bacteria that's things are being broken down into nutrients there's beautiful plants growing around the system all we're doing is taking what's already around us this world has provided us with everything we need and hopefully we haven't abused it too hard and hopefully it will continue giving us everything we need if we learn how to uh, live in sync with this world and, and start listening to what it gives us. It will give us a place to live forever, for generations and generations and generations. Your, your great, 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 great grandchildren will be happy and healthy here. And they really don't have to do, uh, they don't really have to stress and, and they don't really have to kill themselves trying to come up with new techniques, panicking about problems, because it's all right here. Um, so I, I hope aquaponics teaches us that uh, the world will provide us with what we need. And it's just a small example. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, lots you. of thank yous in the queue from Mark Goodall. Nice talk. Many thanks. Love your passion and enthusiasm. Uh, Bev Mundell, thank you so much. Good thank luck. You. Laura Schultz, thank you, Mike, for your presentation. Excellent information and so on. Um, I want to thank you on behalf of SACPA for your time. And um, I want to invite everybody to join us next week, Thursday, Alberta, Alberta's 2021 municipal election. Did partisan politics influence the results with Barry Morishita? And we'll see you next week. Okay, thanks everyone. Thanks for the, uh, thanks for giving me this uh, opportunity to speak about aquaponics and have a wonderful day. Stay healthy and happy. Mm -hmm.